we can put this up on the um, D2L when we're all said and done. Um, there is a chat feature. My dog is half lab, quarter basset and quarter beak. Let me just ask what kind of a dog she is. Um, she's a sweetie. She's getting old and she's now kind of a pain in the butt. Um, but she's still love her, right? Isn't that what we do with our dogs? Yeah. Morning, Carter. Morning. And morning, Keely. All right, can everybody hear? Yep, thumbs up. All right, cool. You can either, I mean, we're small enough class, you can either, um, good morning, Carter. You can either just unmute yourself and um, go ahead and ask the question, or there's also a chat feature. And if you don't know where that's at, it's either gonna be up on top or it's gonna be down on the bottom. Good morning, Freddie. Um, and you could just put a question in there if you want to, or you could just interrupt as well. Either, all of those things will work. Okay, how cute. Aww. That's the best thing. You get to have your animals and your coffee and being your his name. And his name is Bean. Nap and yeah, his name is Bean, and he's actually my roommates, but I think he likes me as much as he likes her. So, <laughs> love black cats. I think yeah. they're awesome. He's a pain. We're trying to play fetch right now, but he lost his thing we're playing fetch with. So, oh no. <laughs> yeah. Cool. I didn't know cats would play fetch. Yeah, I've taught all three of the cats I've owned to play fetch. So. Oh, very cool. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to share my screen here, and we've got a couple things to do, and then I'm going to have you watch a video and do one of the activities that we would have done in class today. Um, all right, so do, do, my internet is, is lagging on me this morning. All right, there we go. All right, all right. Oh, forget the date here. I didn't change my date. How many of you um, have ever thought about social media? as a means of increasing the literacy with your students. It's, it's one of, the, one of the, the best ways to go about getting, your students are doing it. They're either Snapchatting with each other or they're texting each other throughout the day. Or if you just think about scrolling through Instagram or Facebook, they're reading a ton of material a day, but they don't think about it as reading because it's in short snippets. And that's one of the things that is being modified a little bit in the classrooms is that our, our schools and our teachers are embracing that social media aspect. One, because it's quick communication, but also because it's, it's something that they're really um, involved in and, and doing on a day-to-day -day basis. If you had your students count the number of words that they read in their text message, messages each day, it's going to be upwards of three to 4,000 words a day that they're reading. And if you tell them to go read 4,000 words in a textbook, they're going to look at you like you've lost your mind because that's a lot of text for them to, for them to look through. Okay. So one of the things you guys aren't seeing, you're seeing the full screen, right? You're not seeing all the people on my screen. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. I'm going to close that anyway. All right. So, um, one of the things we want to talk about this morning is how what your students bring to the party um, from their own background towards their own literacy. And when your students are not engaged and they're not active, oftentimes it's because of what they're bringing with them to the classroom. They, they often don't have um, background experience. You've got students who've never seen a book. You've got students that don't own a book. You've got students who do nothing but um, maybe just play video games, which is literacy based, don't get me wrong there, but they don't, they don't engage in increasing their own understanding of a, a full spectrum of literacy. It's more about very specific things and the way that their life experiences impact the way that they learn is what we need to think about in terms of your content literacy. So for example, you've got those students who are, they're game based. Um, they do nothing but play video games. We need to now use that to our advantage in the classroom. How can we gamify what we're doing in the classroom for them to want to um, learn the, the material that we are trying to get them to understand. It's one of the biggest challenges because again, if you have 30 kids in a class, you've got 30 different 
backgrounds. You've got 30 different experiences. You've got 30 different ideas that are all going on all at the same time. And you as the educator need to figure out how best to do that individually for every single student. You can't just do it as a blanket approach anymore. Um, we're living in a world where the students, and, and this is it, they're, they're scanners, they're surfers. And our, and our students are all going to, you're going to have some who can sit down and digest very quickly. You're going to have some who need to um, think about what's being done over 24 hour time period. Um, the second one here is though what is, is happening. And it's one of the things um, I think it's both good and it's bad. Our, our student, like, I want you to think about this. If you send an email to an instructor that you have in class, and you don't hear from them for 24 to 48 hours. And if you look at most of your classes syllabuses, that's gonna be that return rate on those emails. How many of you are frustrated because you don't hear back from some of them for 24 to 48 hours? It, it, it can be one of those, you're working on it right now. I have a question, if I have to wait 48 hours, now I'm out of that groove, I'm out of that, that mojo that I've got going towards that. The problem with that is that you as educators, um, if you send me a text message, like I say, I'll get back to you right away. But now I want you to think about that in your own classroom. I want you to put your teacher lens on and I want you to think about that in terms of what you will now have to deal with. And, and I don't mean deal with in a negative way, but you as educators want to do nothing but get your students that information. You want to get them promoting their own advocacy. You want them to move ahead forward quicker. You don't want them to have to wait. But now you've got 120 kids that you're dealing with on a daily basis and they contact you and you want to get right back to them. But you've also got lives and you're going to have families and you're going to have stuff that you're out doing. And sometimes turning that off as an educator is really difficult. But again, that awesome immediate feedback is often what our students today really, really crave, but think about their world. They go play a video game and they get immediate feedback. They might get a, a token or they might get a new uniform or they might get to up a level. They get that immediate feedback. This one right here is, it, it's still really even tough for me. So if you have a student, they're really looking for short, sweet, direct. They don't want necessarily to have all those questions being asked back to them. Now, we know pedagogically that those questions are where they need to go. We need to not give them an answer. We need to get them to them developing their own answer. But they will fight you on this. For example, if you ask me a question, chances are I'm going to ask you a question back. And a lot of you know right away that in your own learning, your own personality, that that frustrates you. I asked you how to do this, why can't you just tell me? Or I asked if this is right and you won't just tell me if this is okay. Our students want that directness, but it's not the best for them, all right? They are technologically savvy, but here's the catch. They know what they know. And that's all that they know. And if you think about what our students today know about technology, they know social media, they know the apps that they use. But if you were to sit down and tell one of your students to solve a website that wasn't working, it might be something as simple as they don't know um, what to do to solve an HTTP problem to an HTTPS problem. And that is that technology, they're technologically savvy, but they're not necessarily technologically savvy to everything that we need to do. Um, so Freddie asks, when does that become detrimental to them with all the slang and short guts when reading on social media and video games? You have to think about it in terms of the hook. You want them to be able to gather the, the wherewithal, you want them to be um, hooked into what you're doing. And sometimes we have to use those social media slangs. We have to allow them to type and write in their way in order to get them to the next step. That's going to be their scaffolding for that. Um, Fortnite um, can be used in the classroom as a scaffolding tool. You want them to learn about geometry and angles. 
So let's start with Fortnite. Let's get them hooked on that. And then let's have them use that Fortnite in their learning of a 90 degree angle. Um, you want them to learn how to play a new game in Phi Ed. Let's watch a little bit of the, the Lakers and Knicks playing, right? Let's, let's hook them and then scaffold them to where they need to be. Our students used to, and, and this is a great point, Freddie, our students used to come in formally educated already, and they don't anymore. And that's probably an okay thing in the long run, as long as we don't let them live in that world, right? Because you guys all know, you can't write a paper in text speak for any of your instructors. They're, they're gonna ding you on it. They want you to, to do it formally. The world wants you to do it formally. If you go to Walmart to their customer service counter, you don't want them to speak in gibberish. You want to be able to understand them. That's gonna be that um, combined and collective um, unity that we all need to get to, but use that stuff that they're doing in social media and video games as the hook to get them there. Okay. Does that answer your question, Freddie? All right. Very cool. Um, here's, here's the one that's really kind of, they're always hurried. And, and you guys think about that. You're hurrying to the next thing. You're hurrying to the next step. You're hurrying to where we're going to go next. And our students are doing the same thing. So they don't want to live in anything longer than about two weeks. And two weeks is really their, their, it's their border. It's their, their unit. Um, and sometimes it's even going to be shorter than that because they get bored with what they're doing because again, they're living in that world of, of quickness, right? Um, in your classrooms, when you're developing lessons, um, the, the norm right now is to develop 10 minute chunks, 10 minute chunks that you chunk together to make a longer classroom. So for a 50 minute classroom, you're really doing five different things throughout that classroom, that class period. If you have a 90 minute class period, you're really doing nine different things. That 10 minutes is really where they're about where they need a transition of some sort. And, and I want you to think about that in your old, own world as you're going through your day to day. Can you sit and stare and listen for any length of time for longer than about 10 minutes before your mind starts wandering a little bit or you check your email or you check your text or you have to get up and move, something like that. This one right here is the biggest key. Our students wanna learn. There's, there's such a, a negative connotation to the students that are out there in the world today that they don't wanna learn, that they know it all. And, and here's the key. Our students have at their disposal more information than our generations ever had. I used to have to go to an encyclopedia. That encyclopedia never changed. Once we got the internet, now all of a sudden it was there, but it was still static on the internet. Today, information and facts and mythological facts and all of those things, it changes on a minute by minute basis. And our students crave that immediacy as it goes along, okay? So here's the key to this lecture. If you're gonna be that lecture-based teacher, um, there are some statistics. Boston University did do the research. It limits their short-term memory. And students will oftentimes remember the very beginning and they'll remember the very end. And students don't like to just sit and be talked to and lectured and just simply write the notes down. We've talked about that a little bit. We want them to get actively thinking, no matter what they're doing, okay? Now, this right here just goes along with some of the other stuff that we were talking about. They wanna know why, they want those boundaries set for them. But again, they'll accept boundaries, but you need to do those boundaries with them, not to them. So you ask the students, so what do you think is a good due date for this? You guys had a small taste of that with your competencies that you created. And, and I want you to go back to when I first gave you all that competency sheet, right? And you're getting some of that from Hales. You're starting to get that from some of your other instructors on campus as well. I want you to think about your initial hesitation. Well, so I can create my own due date and I can create my own assignment yeah but tell me what you want me to do and then i'll do it for you and we call that playing school and the more ownership you give your students 
the better off, better off isn't necessarily a good word there, the, the more buy-in they give to their own education. Now they feel like they're with you rather than against you. They feel like they're walking that rope with you as opposed to um, being told what to do. And I want you to think about that in terms of all of your content areas. If you give uh, an ag student the opportunity to um, do A or do B, um, now you've given them that voice and choice in their classroom. They get, to, they get to take their idea and run with it that they want to do. Um, if you're in a facts classroom, you can give them the same, you, you wanna make a, a custard pie or do you wanna make a souffle? Same kind of a skill base for both of those things, but now they get to choose what they want to do. Same thing with history. Um, it, thematically is where history is kind of going rather than, than linearly. They're, they're kind of going away a little bit from the, let's start at Revolutionary War and go forward time-wise. Um, let's talk about all of the great generals throughout history and those kinds of things. It's that voice and choice that our kids really, really want. And again, it goes right to those ideas that we talked about right away at the beginning. These are the, the three really big pedagogically, um, um, big ideas that are going right now in education. And I can tell you that although they're new to education, they're not new. The, is, education's kind of in a, in a cyclical pattern as well. Problem-based learning has been around forever. You guys learn to walk using problem-based learning. You, you tried something, you stood up, you fell, you got a bruise, you did it again the next day. This right here, student-centered instruction, is the students driving their own, um, their, their own learning, their own um, outcomes, their own education. This is happening in quite a few schools across South Dakota right now. Um, Clear Lake has it, Harrisburg has it, there's a couple in Sioux Falls. Um, you've got oh, Clark, um, there's just several smaller schools too across the state that are getting to this student-centered instruction. And then you've got competency-based. So rather than doing everything based on a final test, you're having the students create a, a product, some sort of um, definition of learning, some sort of um, exhibition that they have to demonstrate their learning as opposed to just doing a test or something like that, okay? The student-centered student learning, these are just ideas that you can go with in order to get that ac accomplished. This right here is typically the, the toughest problem, those open-ended questions and problems. We tend to start with why, and we tend to start with what's, and that, yeah, I'm gonna give you a, a sheet with a bunch of open-ended question starters that really helps you to, in the moment, think about what those questions need to be. Self-paced. So again, go back to your own competencies that you have to do for this class. You guys all got to choose when's a good time for you to get those things turned in. I had a couple, they're turning stuff in this week already. That's awesome. That they're, they're on it. They're going. Um, it's not me giving you an arbitrary deadline. And, and, and I want you to think about this. How many times do you have an arbitrary deadline and you wait until the last moment anyway because you had other stuff that you had to get done first or this took more priority or I'm going to be gone this week. I have to get it done sooner, but I can't turn it in until then. All of those things change the way the student learns. All of those things change the way the student um, digests the information that you are giving to them, all right? This is another key thing. So if you're giving them anything, and again, I'm using reading here in a really broad sense because we read in a lot of different ways, right? Whether it's you watching a student do something or them watching another student, that's a type of reading as well. Give them a purpose. Give them a reason for what they're doing. So if you give them something to read tonight, you want them to read a paragraph, give them something specific to focus on that they can bring back. All of a sudden you now have a student who only had to do one thing. They didn't have to digest and understand the whole, but now they've read it more closely because they have that focus in mind. But this is the key to this. You have to make sure you use it in class the next time. So this could be something as simple as if you're gonna send a video home for them to watch, give them one thing that they have to focus on throughout the video. And don't make it something that's at the beginning or the end, make it something that's in the middle so that you know that they're getting through a lot of that stuff. 
it, it gets them more in tune. It gets them more focused on what they are supposed to be um, paying attention to in any of those literacy-based things. So if you're, in a, and I like to give examples of our, our non-content areas because I think those are the toughest in some of these. So if you're in a phi ed class and everybody's learning to play kickball and you tell everybody not to just watch for the big rules of kickball, but watch for the way um, they step up to kick the ball. So you've given them one thing to focus on, one skill that they need to observe and watch, and then it knocks back all of those things that they have to process. It just focuses their attention. It gives them a more direct idea as it goes along. All right, so here's where we're gonna have some fun. So if, if this was an activity I was doing in class, and I want you to think about this in terms of, of even doing it in a format like this, because as we were talking before, a lot of people came on, a lot of schools are, are not having class. A lot of our school districts are one-to-one, -one, and the new trend that's happening as a result of that is that we no longer have snow days at school. We have, um, you are still at home, you have to touch base with your teacher, the instructors will have stuff for you to do. E even in FIAD and FACS and AG, where they're very hands-on in the classroom, there are, are activities that can be done um, digitally so the students don't lose out on information for the day. They now are connecting with their teacher in a format like this. It's kind of cool. It's not something most of you would want to do full time because, you know, we love being in the classroom. We love having our students there with us, those kinds of things. But this is one of those things that you can do in the classroom as well as doing it this way, as well as doing it in a flipped lesson format. All right. So if I'm doing this in the classroom, I would not give them this portion of it right here. I would give them this portion of it right there, the what I see. And as I show you this video, what I want you to do is I want you just to simply write down some of those things that you see, not think about, not digest, not process, just what you see, things that you literally see, all right? Everybody good with that? All right, Freddie's kids are gonna love this. All right, here we go. Just what you see.
All right, so when you think about the things that you just saw, now as a class with your students, you can together just simply write down some of the things that you saw. So what did you see? And again, you can say it out loud or you can put it in the chat too. What'd you see? A spaceship. Awesome. The lemons were only 98 cents. <laughs> I was just confused on how we could afford lemons, but not the game. <laughs> Or the, the rocket ship. <laughs> All right, so. Good. What else? He was the only adult face we saw, but only after he grew up. It was like the peanuts, where they only show like the bottom half. Oh, sure. And his mom disappeared. <laughs> like like in, she just disappeared. <laughs> the old man had um, tears in his eyes. Well, it makes me cry every time I see that. I was like, it's too early if this rocket ship doesn't work. <laughs> Problem solving and goal setting. Awesome. Okay, so. Can you I'm see? I'm gonna do a this. So, what did you literally see that led you to that? Oh, what are you doing? Uh, him looking up at the moon. Good. And then collecting money. Good. And that's exactly where you go with your students then. So once you get a list of things that they visually see, things that they they don't have to think about, things they don't have to really. Um, do anything about and now they can start to digest these things so him looking at the moon and collecting money um, we see as problem solving and goal setting right um, spaceship what does that make you think about his love space Ooh. did you say loves yeah okay cool all right Imagination, somebody wrote. Disappointment, I'm reading. Excitement. The spaceship, it kind of made me think that he wanted to get away. Oh. <laughs> so what else? What about like childhood? Childhood. Yeah. All right, so now I want you to think about this. Oftentimes when we give our students, we give our learners something to do, we ask them to jump to this step. We want them to think about what this stuff means. In literacy, what we want to do is we want to scaffold it to where they can get to this. And if we give them only put down things that you see, only think about those things that are tangible. Only think about those things that you don't have to think about yet. Then you get them together and now they have time to process what these things actually mean. Did he, did he seem scared or anything that the mom disappeared? No, he didn't. But they don't have to do both of those ideas. When we think about literacy, we oftentimes want our students to, and we, we have steps beyond what we want them to think about, but we oftentimes yeah. forget that in order for them to process and digest this, they have to start here. Oftentimes we'll get them here. We want them to give us this stuff. You know, we'll say problem solving and goal setting, and then we want them to think back on what they see. And our students, can't really do both of those things at the same time. That doesn't mean they can't get to where they can do that at the same time, but we have to, again, scaffold for them so that they can understand and be literate in your content area to get to here. So you're, you're in a history class and you ask them the question about, um, so what were the economic impacts of World War II? All of a sudden, we've got them to that middle level questioning, but we haven't gotten them to that lower level questioning for them to think about that upper level questioning. 
So this activity right here, I love to do with just about everything. I mean, we have so much visualness going on in our classes that if we just simply knock our students back to a minute and we say, what do you see? Don't think about what you see yet. Just what do you see? What are you observing? What are you looking at? What are you tangibly able to identify? Then get them to think about what's going on here. Okay. Does that make sense? Awesome. Does anybody have any questions on that? Oh, all right. So I'm going to show you in D2L here where I have, we call them web level questionings. And so it's going to be underneath content and it's going to be there for this week, right? And this right here is one of the best documents. I mean, Bloom's is really good. Don't get me wrong, web level questioning takes it to a different level um, in terms of visualness, in terms of people being able to see where they're at. So right here is where most of our students kind of live most of their high school career. And you all need to stop that. We need to get them over here. We need to get them thinking about things. Think about the, the, the kid in the video, right? He, he had to think about a way to get the money. He had to think about a way to get himself to the moon. He didn't just stop and say, cool, I need five cents to put in the, in the slot so that I can ride this machine for 12 seconds. He had to think beyond that. He had to dream. He had to process to get there. So the first couple pages of this are, are really just other pieces of information. These are word starters, question starters for that recall. As you are developing lesson plans, what I want you to start thinking about is how many of your preconceived questions start with these recalls, start with the recall pieces of information. Because remember, literacy and content literacy is all about getting them to understand your content area to a deeper level than just this recall. How many of your starters of your questions begin with the hows and the whats? And how many of them start with this upper level, those really deep processing questions of synthesizing, proving, designing. And all of you have seen blooms. You're seeing elements of blooms in here. This just gives you a list of starters, starter questions so that you can stop just simply asking the what's or the how's that simply have them recall information and get them thinking about things at a deeper level. So how would you, suppose you could travel to the moon on that spaceship outside of the grocery store, what would you do once you got there? And those questions now get the students thinking other than those very simple questions that we oftentimes ask them of, so what did he sell to get money? And those don't get those students beyond anything other than that observation. And we have to start at the observation, but we need to then get them to this right here. So start with these and end up here, okay? Now this right here, I used to have on my desk because as instructors, as teachers, we tend to get caught in using the same questions over and over and over and over again. And then we don't know, we kind of get lost in our own head as well. And we forget what some of those upper level questions are. And then what we do oftentimes is we'll send them home with homework that asks them these questions, but we miss all that thinking. We miss all that brainstorming together. We miss all of that collaboration that you can do with all of your students in the classroom itself. Right. Thoughts, questions? All right, so this is, again, in content in this week's stuff, all right? You'll also have a Flipgrid in there um, and those kinds of things. We're going to do a lot of hands-on things next week, including, including some things with your tech. So make sure you've got your tech with you. Make sure you've got your running shoes on. I'm only slightly kidding there. I'm not going to make you run. 
right? But make sure that you are, are ready to be active. All right, next week. Anybody have any questions? <coughs> awesome. Did Lorenzo hit the hay? Is he sleeping? <laughs> oh, he might be. Wouldn't that be funny? <laughs> he said he was going to take a nap after this. I don't know. <laughs> Funny. All right. Questions, you guys? And you know what to do if you do, right? If you have questions for me, don't hesitate. Send me an email. Send me a text. Do what you need to do. All right? All right. All right. Thoughts? What do you think? Like this program? Yeah, I like this a lot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I'm glad you're all on um, and, and at least used it. And I know Hale's used it last night with his class, too. So um, everybody's going to slowly be using it. Um, but again, and we can do this anytime you need to, too, if you just need to chat with somebody, sometimes looking at them face to face. If you're stuck at home or I'm not there or something like that, we can, we can do this as well. All right. Okay. Awesome. All right. So everybody go have a cup of coffee or tea and enjoy your day. <laughs> Thanks. You too. Bye. Bye.